get the you don't get the bangs in some places. So. Uh... Um, we're going to get the latest update on unemployment figures at 7 o'clock this morning, um, but they might not show actually how many people are out at work or at risk as well. Nina can explain more for us. Morning. Yes, good morning. It's always tricky going through the numbers, but particularly so at the, mo at the moment. Good morning. That's right. An important update on unemployment figures later. Day after day, we've been hearing about jobs under threat, jobs being lost. And even the Chancellor told Breakfast last, last week that hardship lies ahead. He cannot, he said, save every business and every job. So these numbers later, what should we be looking for? Well, let's start with the unemployment rate. Last month, that was 3.9%, or about 1.35 million people, which is the same as pre-lockdown, which is strange, isn't it? Why is that? Well, it's partly to do with the way the numbers are gathered. It doesn't count people who are out of work but not yet registered looking for a job. And the furlough scheme could be masking reality. The government is paying the majority of wages of 9.6 million jobs. Between now and October, that scheme will be wound down and it's expected many more jobs will be lost. Now, this is Luke. His job means he can't work from home, but he has a major health condition. So he was happy when he was furloughed, but now he's been told his job is at risk. I was born with a chronic renal failure, so I, I, and I had to go on uh, dialysis for seven years because I had an unsuccessful transplant when I was three. Um, so when 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 COVID arised, um, uh, the only way that I can travel to work is is via public transport, and um, I I was just very um, nervous about doing that because I I felt that like, because I've kind of lost the majority of my childhood. I didn't want to put myself in danger of being able to continue to live live life to the full. I got I got sent home and I was a bit up in the air as to what what was going to happen because I I, I live on my own, so I haven't been able to see any friends, family, and I was worried about being able to afford my rent, food, and 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 other kind of bills really. And then, luckily, then obviously the government. Um, announced the furlough scheme. The latest is is that 30% of the staff are back, um, but unfortunately, because there's been they've had to keep another business in float by giving them a rebate, that um, there's going to be redundancies, and we'll find out in the next few weeks. A really anxious time for Luke, and we wish him all the best. And um, what can we learn from today's figures? Then, well, this is really important. We'll be looking at the number of people on the payroll. That's the HMRC National Register. Last month, it showed there were just over 28 million paid employees, and that was down by 650,000 since the beginning of lockdown. And then there were the weekly hours worked. That's also fallen by a record amount since the start of the pandemic. Now, the Bank of England has estimated that unemployment could reach 7% come the autumn. That would translate to about 2.5 million people out of a job. Experts, other experts, though, say that could be much higher, especially if we have a second spike. Predictions are very difficult at the moment, but we will be doing our very best after seven o'clock. And then at eight o'clock, do you remember yeah. the dragon from Dragon's Den, James Conn? Now, he's an expert in recruitment. He's going to be looking at the numbers with us, but also giving important tips on what you can do to make sure your CV is up to date if you are entering the jobs market at a time when it is going to be really competitive. It is. You are watching Breakfast, yes, as John says, 22 minutes past seven, and there's been an update on the latest unemployment figures. I know that Nina is looking at the details. Hello. Yeah, we've been looking through the report that came out um, in the last 10 minutes or so. Good morning. Yeah, we've had an update on unemployment and the wider jobs market. It is a sobering read, as you might imagine. What we've seen is the biggest quarterly drop in employment since 2009, just after the financial crisis. Every day we're hearing, aren't we, about more jobs being lost, jobs under threat. And even the Chancellor told Breakfast that hardship lies ahead. Let's start with the unemployment rate. That's the percentage of people out of work between April and June. Now, that's remained steady at 3.9% or 1.35 million. That's similar to pre-lockdown. It suggests that things haven't got worse, but that's because it doesn't count people out of work and looking for a job. Now, this is far more telling. This is the number of people registered on the national payroll. Between April and June, 730,000 people left the payroll, so stopped being in staff employment, and that is a big downward turn. 
and this is really important too. They've looked at the number of hours collectively worked. Now that has hit an all time low and it doesn't take an economist to work out that that isn't good news for jobs. Um, a slight ray of sunshine, if you can call it that. The number of vacancies is up slightly on the last month, but nowhere near pre-lockdown. Um, inside the report, it says that those jobs are around people trying to make their work environment COVID safe, which is interesting. Um, and the truth is that worth is to come, of course, because through the furlough scheme, the government is paying the majority of wages of 9.6 million jobs between now and October. That scheme, of course, will end and it's expected many, many more jobs will be lost. The Bank of England has estimated that unemployment could reach 7% come the autumn. That could mean two and a half million people out of a job. And other experts say that that could be way, way higher, especially if we see a second spike. And, and you know, when you look at the numbers and the 730,000 people who are now no longer registered on PAYE, mm. it shows that the worry is these people are over 65 or self-employed or in part-time work. So they're the kinds of jobs, the kind of people that might struggle to pick up work again. And the implication is people who are on full-time work. There's still millions of them on the furlough scheme. So obviously the prediction is that things will get worse. You sort of get a sense, Lena, that we're just beginning to see the real fallout as well. There are other economic figures coming out later in the week. Yeah, that's right. Tomorrow we'll look at GDP. So that's the mass of everything we make and do, how much we're worth. Um, and we're expected to officially announce at that point that we have hit a recession. And you're absolutely right. These figures only go up to the end of June. We don't really know the full picture for July. And as the Chancellor has told us, there are dark days ahead and this is going to get worse, especially as we hit the autumn when the furlough scheme. I wish I could say something more cheerful. And yeah, there's a small ray of light with those job vacancies, but that's because they're around COVID safety. So unfortunately, there's very little good news to bring you. You've got a good recruitment guest though on later. We have James Carr will be on a bit later. He's uh, one of the dragons from Dragon's Den. Now he owns um, several recruitment companies. So he'll be giving tips on how you can spruce up your CV and get yourself best place to find a job if you are unemployed or facing unemployment. Thanks. <laughs> it's 8.34, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Louise Minchin and John Kay today. So, employment in the UK fell by the largest amount in over a decade between April and June. This is according to figures which are out this morning. There's one reason why uh, we can guess what it is, uh, but Nina's going to tell us a little bit more on what can be done. Morning. Yeah, good morning. It hasn't been pleasant reading the report from the ONS this morning. And um, these figures break down how the job markets and unemployment figures are looking day after day, week after week. We've been hearing about redundancies and jobs under threat. Now, unemployment percentage has stayed the same at 3.9 percent. But that's because it doesn't take into account those who are out of work but not actively looking for a job. Have a look at this, though. This is the number of people registered on the national payroll. Now, that's fallen by 730,000 since March, since around the time of the beginning of the crisis. That is the biggest downturn we've seen ever, and it's set to get worse when the furlough scheme ends. When you look at the numbers in a bit more detail, one group that's been particularly hard hit is older workers. And there's concern that many of them may never work again, especially as training schemes and apprenticeships focus on the young. Our business correspondent, Sarah Corker, has been speaking to some people who are wondering what the future might hold. Somebody like myself still has a significant number of years before I can retire and I do need to work. The major challenge being a bit older is knowing that the employers are probably you're going to pass you up for a younger applicant. Well, I've been here quite a few times before, so... <laughs> um, and it never gets any easier, obviously, because as you get older, it gets more difficult. I've already applied for that one. For those suddenly made redundant in their 50s and 60s, the prospect of finding a new job competing against younger candidates can be incredibly tough. You know, we are reliable, we're mature, sensible. Julie's been job hunting since May. The party and events company she worked for in Dorset went bust, a casualty of the lockdown. As more and more businesses every day are collapsing, they are laying out more and more people like myself who've got years of experience who are looking in job adverts every day and thinking there's just nothing there, there's no end in sight. Julie says while the Kickstart scheme has helped younger workers, yes. there's little support for her generation. When the government said they were going to do the 300,000 apprenticeships, 
I was sat at home thinking, well, hold on a minute, that could be 300,000 jobs that could be given to older people. And I just think it's as if we've been forgotten. Many over 50s now have to wait until they're 66 to get their state pension. Keith is 63 and lost his finance job in Derbyshire last month. I've applied for Job Seekers Allowance about a week and a half ago, and I expect to hear from them in the next week or two. And have you ever applied for that before? I have never applied for any benefit in my life. So doing it at 63 must have been a bit of a shock for you, maybe? Very demeaning. After a lifetime in work, he's now facing the most competitive jobs market for decades. Someone said to me, but if you're looking for experience, you're looking for experience. Yes, but how many years experience? 10, 20, 30? Most companies would look at the long-term long prospect. Mm. So how does that make, make you feel? Uh, it makes me feel that I've got to fight a bit harder. Since February, the number of over 50s claiming unemployment benefits has nearly doubled, rising by 280,000. One in four older workers, around 2.5 million, have been furloughed. And women over 50 are most likely to be hardest hit. Figures suggest nearly 100,000 have left the workforce entirely. In Greater Manchester, Heather believes she's previously been the victim of age discrimination. The best one is you're overqualified, which doesn't make any sense to me because, you know, if you're qualified to this level, then you can do any job up until that level. Um, so over, being overqualified doesn't mean a thing, except it's another way of saying you're too old. Some people might say, you're 69, enjoy your retirement, put your feet up, but that's not what you want to do, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really don't. If somebody left me a million pounds, I'd still want to work. Julie, Keith and Heather want to get their working lives back on track. But the fear is some over 50s could be forced into a retirement they can't afford. Sarah Corker, BBC News. Oh, we wish Julie, Keith and Heather all the best. We're joined now by James Kahn from Dragon's Den, who's also in, um, works with 23 recruitment companies. A very good morning to you. What do you make of this morning's report? Nearly three quarters of a million fewer on the payroll than there were at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, I think this is really devastating information. When I read it this morning, I had a look through and what I saw was there are 9.2 million people on furlough right now with an additional 2.6 million claiming benefits, which is nearly 11.8 million people today who are either being subsidised by the government or out of work. I mean, that is an unprecedented situation. That's only 42% of the UK working population today that is either on government subsidies or out of work. I mean, this is probably, I think, the worst since we've seen since the Second World War. But necessary measures, surely, from the Chancellor. I mean, you know, I think the government have done a fantastic job with the support they've shown. But the only thing that really bugs me is this new scheme that they've introduced where they're offering a £1,000 for each employee that an employer takes back. I think it was quite ill thought through because when you look at it, we've got 9.2 million people currently on furlough. The budget of the economic responsibilities have said that they expect at least 70% of those people who will come back to work anyway. The government should have put more money into the people who are not going back to work rather than the people or giving bonuses to employees for the people who would go back. So if you look at that £1,000 they're offering with 9.2 million people out of work, that's literally £9 billion that they'll be giving to employers. But 70% of those employees were going to go back anyway. So that 70%, which is £7 billion, I would like to have seen that go towards the unemployed or the people will actually be out of work rather than paying that money or that £1,000 to employers for bringing back people that they would have brought back anyway. So whilst I think the government have done a great job, the thing that I'm slightly concerned about is that particular scheme was probably ill thought through. Because theoretically, of course, those jobs would still exist, so the £1,000 you think could be better spent elsewhere. Where, though, because there's particular concern in today's numbers about the under-25s and the over-60s, how can we address their concerns about the future job market? 
Well, I mean, there's no question. I think that there are going to be some incredible challenges that we're going to be facing over the next six months. I think we need to be retraining a lot of our employed people today because what we've seen through this pandemic is a transformation of the way we work today. I think we're going to see more and more people working from home. So the landscape of employment has changed anyway, whereas before, most employers were limited to hiring people based on their commuting distance. Today, if so many of us are working from home, that barrier of, of commuting distance doesn't really apply anymore. So I think the government literally could have had five billion set aside that they're going to give to employers about people they were going to bring back anyway. We could have spent that five billion literally retraining some of our workforce. When I looked at your article this morning, interview, you know, the, the, the younger people and the older people, they're going to be the worst affected. So support there in terms of training, cross-training, different skills. Imagine the sector, the, the kind of hospitality sector, which is one of the largest employees in this country, you know, literally has been devastated. Those millions of people, what are they going to be doing? So I think providing them opportunity, providing them financial support, giving them the opportunity to cross-train into other sectors, there are many different things we could be doing, but right now, unfortunately, those people have been left behind. What would you say to people watching this morning, and there will be people watching this morning, worrying that they're going to come off furlough to a job that doesn't exist, who are already unemployed? What practical measures can they take if they're looking for work? Because you work closely with recruiters. I do, yeah. I mean, I think we're going to see the greatest rise of the entrepreneur in the next 12 months. I think because, in my honest opinion, I think there will be fewer jobs. Of the 26 businesses, recruitment businesses that I look after, the one thing we have seen is an absolute decline in the number of jobs being registered. I also have an app called Debu that tracks graduate jobs, and we've seen a massive drop off of the number of graduate jobs being registered. So clearly, I think that there will be some issues. So I think what would I recommend? I think a lot of people think about starting their own business. When you look to start your own business, it doesn't mean you need to take premises or raise a lot of capital. I've met many people recently who've effectively become freelance. So, you know, if they had a job working in a company for the sake of argument, maybe they were in credit control collecting receivables, but that job's gone. They've now started to go out to organizations and employers and saying, how can I help you collect your receivables? I'm not looking for full time, but I'll take one day a week. And somebody I met recently has now got six clients that they're working with, you know, on a one day, half a day per week, but actually earning more money than they were earning before. So one of the things that I think you could absolutely do is use the skills that you have rather than a full-time basis, maybe approach employers with the opportunity of freelancing your skill set. Because okay. I think in that example, you can still run your own business, have the flexibility, but probably potentially earn more than you were earning before. OK, James Kahn, many thanks. And it's interesting that he finished on that point because what this report shows is for the first time there's more than a million people on zero hours contract. The implication being, as James was alluding to there, that people will be moving more towards independent labour and also employers will be yeah. sticking to zero hours contracts to give themselves more agility as the economy is so dynamic, dynamic at the moment. But that's not necessarily great if you want a steady income every month. It's trying to see through the months ahead, yeah. isn't it? And trying to, you know, having that kind of clarity in the face of adversity. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks.